We interrupt the regular programming on the Levity Zone to bring you a special yet sad report. The passing last week on April 13, 2017, of Bob Taylor, a friend and neighbor here in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Bob was literally the innovative father of much of the technology that each of us sits in front of or holds in our hands every day. As funder of Doug Engelbart's lab at SRI in the mid-1960s, he helped bring forth the first interactive shared computing information environment with a mouse. Later in the 60s, as the head of the ARPANET project at DARPA, he funded the teams that brought you the forebear of the Internet. As the director of the computer science lab at the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, or PARC, in the 1970s, he nurtured researchers who created the Alto, the world's first personal computer on a network using a mouse, windows, and icons, and the first versions of the applications we all use today. Going on to head Digital Equipment Corporation, or DEX, lab in the 1980s and 90s, he helped birth AltaVista, the first powerful web search engine two years before Google. So join us for the first of several conversations held back in 2014 when I brought the author Adam Fisher to visit Bob at his house up off Skyline Drive in Woodside, California. Well, the, it, the publisher is Hachette. Hachette. And they're one of the big five. Go right down. They call it. Go right down. Go right down. Go on. Go on. Luke. Go lie down. So who so, else are you interviewing? Well, I mean, I was uh, negotiating with Adele just today. I, I, Goldberg? I, yes. Uh -huh. I, Alan Kay sat, uh -huh. like, gave me a long, long interview. It was very quotable. And then mm -hmm. Backer. And Butler, Lampson. Have you interviewed him yet? Yes, he's great. They're both great. Yeah. Some of this you can use archival stuff too. Mm -hmm. So I interviewed Simone before because I did an oral history of space tourism. So I have some archival stuff and then he's on the record. At, mm -hmm. But the book is going from 68, Bang Bart, and it's maybe it's going to end at the job's funeral, I think. It's, there's not really an ending to this story, but that gives kind of a human ending. That was my editor's idea. I don't know if it's a good one, but he wants to get it so that the internet generation recognizes some of their history, so post-95. My feeling is I, I meet a lot of the internet generation smart people. They don't have any idea. Atari is a Japanese company. They're vaguely aware of Park, but couldn't really explain anything about it. They all know the Apple story pretty well, but <laughs> that's to be expected at this point. So uh, this book is really for them, get them up to speed. Now one of the problems with this oral history approach is that uh, there are probably oh, a half a dozen people you might logically interview who are pathological liars. Oh, if you just tell me who they are. <laughs> <laughs> well, Steve Jobs was one. Well, luckily I don't, have, don't to have to interview him. him. That's almost a, that's a <laughs> that came as a relief because yeah. he's just too central in a way, or he's made yeah. himself too central. Right. right. Uh, let's see, Bob Kahn. Well, I I I haven't inter interviewed Kahn or Surf yet because I wanted to get. Surf is, want you. Surf, okay. Surf is only a minor liar. <laughs> Okay. Compared to Khan. Okay. Khan is a major liar. It's unbelievable. Khan has claimed for many years that he's the he's responsible for the systems design of the ARPANET. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you talk to Frank Hart, who led the BBNN team that built the subnet, or Severo Arnstein, who was the chief hardware designer, or Will Crowder, who was the chief software designer, they say that's simply not true. Mm -hmm. They'll say that Khan was a junior member of that team, he was a theoretician who had very little experience in system design, and he slowed down system design discussions repeatedly because he didn't understand what was going on, so he asked a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one of the biggest uh, falsehoods of the group. Let's see, besides uh, Khan, where are we? Uh, 
Larry Roberts. Okay. Who I hired into uh, ARPA under blackmail conditions. Yes. And uh, he claims that in 1962, he had a discussion with Licklider about the ARPANET and he explained to Licklider how to do it. Well, that's, <laughs> that, that is so far-fetched, it's ridiculous. If you look at his publication record, you'll find nothing about networking in any of his publications or his research interests mm -hmm. uh, until 68, uh, 69 somewhere in there. He did a good job as a program manager of the ARPANET, but he's, he supported Lynn Kleinrock, who's another person on this liar's list. When they both claim that Kleinrock invented packet switching, they claim that in 95. Packet switching was invented in the early 60s, independently by Paul Barron and Donald Davies, and everybody at the time knew that packet switching was invented by those two guys. But in 95, Roberts and Kleinrock suddenly announced that Kleinrock had invented packet switching. Now, a fellow from BBN, whose name well, I can't remember right now, uh, wrote a devastating paper that you should read at some point, if I can ever remember his name, that absolutely destroys Kleinrock's position beautifully. It's really well done. Just boom, 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 boom. Yeah. Well, let's see, who else is on the liar's list? Uh, We've got Kleinrock, Robinson, Kahn, Jobs. I'm sure there are others. A lot of these guys uh, worked on the ARPANET, mm -hmm. but not the internet. Mm -hmm. But they blur the distinction mm -hmm. between the ARPANET and the internet, and thereby claim internet influence. Mm -hmm. But the ARPANET was not an internet. Internet is two or more. Interactive networks. The first two networks were put together by they, Park, by Park. by Computer Science Lab. Yeah, mm -hmm. they, when they put together actually three, they put together the Ethernet, which they invented, with the ARPANET, with the SRI packet radio net. Mm -hmm. That was in about seventy five, seventy six. So that was the first internet. So here's a quote. This is something you wrote. It was a private email. Bruce shared with me. And he said, there is a difference between the guys who designed and built the first Model P and the guy who happened to drive the first one home from a dealer. Yeah. I think that's a great quote, if I may use it. Yeah, sure. And I, let's, but let's talk about what it means. I applied that uh, analogy to Lynn Kleinrock in UCLA. Mm -hmm. Because UCLA is, every October, they make a big deal out of being the first people to send a message on the uh, ARPANET. But they had nothing to do with designing or building the ARPANET. They merely took receipt of the imp from ARPA and uh, hooked it up, and the same thing happened at SRI, and, and a message was sent. But months, or weeks anyway, before that happened, we knew the ARPANET would work because BBN had tested it with emulation, em emulating nodes. Mm -hmm. It was no big deal, and no one made a big deal out of it. But later, Kleinrock realized that he could make a big deal out of it, and so he did, and he has done so ever since. And that's the first message on the ARPANET, which is not the internet. Right. And the first message on what we'll call the real internet. Mm -hmm. I have no idea. <laughs> since we were talking about um, all this stuff, you know, I'm interested in any good stories about uh, Metcalf building that land. You should interview Metcalf. Oh, I, I do plan to. He will, he will be good. Uh, he, here's, a, here's an artifact. That's Dave Boggs' yeah. connection at a park. Yeah. To, I think he's Dorado. In his, he had a Dorado in his office or something? No, he, no, he wouldn't have a Dorado in his office. It would, it would make the office too hot. Too hot, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, there was a, a fleet or a gaggle of Dorados <laughs> in an air-conditioned room at park. So that could well have been... That's the tat lamb tap. <clears throat> yeah, that's three megabit and ten megabit. So I've got some cream colored boxes, which were the uh, the three megabit. This is a ten megabit. Three and ten, both. Both in in the same box. Yeah, they could do both. Huh. That's a tap. That's a tap. Yep. Lamb tat, tap. Tat lamb. Tat lamb. Tat lamb. Yeah. Tat lamb. Yeah. Cable television equipment, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. TCL. It was a clever device. 
it meant you could add a, a node to the uh, Ethernet without taking it down. Mm. I think you could be running, you go in, stick a probe in the cable and wouldn't disturb anything. And wow. You're all up boom. and running. You're yes. up and running. Yeah. <laughs> really great idea. Really good. What else you got in there? Well, here's something. This is like the bookends on deck. So here's a module, a piece of the link made by deck in Maynard, Massachusetts. <laughs> so that's all discrete transistor capacitor stuff, a chunk of a link. You didn't take this out of the link you have it? No, I had extras because that link works, you know. Yeah, I know. The one you saw of it. And this, I was told, is something they call the dragon. Uh huh. Which was the. I know the dragon. Yeah. You know the dragon? What's yeah. the history of the dragon? Well, I don't know its history very well, but uh, Butler might have been involved in that design of the dragon. What are, uh, the dragon was a project done by SDD, Systems Development Division of Xerox, intended to become a product. I don't know what its eventual uh, outcome was. I think they made well, like what, what I was told by the guy, this is from DEC. So this is the Dragon hmm. influence design that was at DEC. So he, he told me this is the last D machine because all a bunch of us who went to DEC took the ideas and made this and it was a multiprocessor board. Oh. And he said, this is Dragon. So <laughs> I thought it would be cool. DEC at either ends of its history, you know. This is clearly a deck board. They all look the same. So it's because of the connectors or? Well, deck started not as a computer company, but as a company making transfer modules uh, hmm. called register transfer register modules. Register transfer modules. Yeah. I didn't know deck made a dragon. Yeah, the guy was quite proud of it. He was one of the Xerox team that went to, to deck. Of course, you pulled a lot of those people into deck. Yeah. In it was at 83 or so. I got a question about death yeah. when you were head yeah. of the lab there. Yeah. So one of the last things that came out of, I think it was your lab, was Alta Vista. Yes. Which was essentially Google before Google. Two years before Google, yes. And at the time, the fastest search engine in the world. And, and I guess Butler told me that the reason it failed is because it was just kind of run out of the marketing budget because they figured it would sell more servers or something. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, Butler would know better than I. To me, it seems, like, if all this is true, and I'm sure it is, that DEC could have been Google. Well, uh, that's pretty far-fetched because, <laughs> okay. because the thing that really made Google was not technology mm -hmm. as so much, but the fact that a guy came along to Google sometime after their wonderful technology, when they were still struggling in spite of their wonderful technology, and he pointed out a marketing strategy by way of selling advertising. Mm -hmm. And that turned Google around. Mm -hmm. Had nothing to do with technology. It's just mm -hmm. a wonderful marketing idea. Mm -hmm. you, you advertise for a company and every time somebody hits on their, their indicator, uh, you charge them a nickel. Yeah. And <laughs> those nickels will pay. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I, I know uh, there's this huge, endless controversy about whether Xerox fumbled the future, uh, which I'd love to get into with you because you're the ultimate person to ask about that. But uh, I, my warm-up question was, did DEC fumble the future? Yeah, yeah, they did. Yeah. It wasn't as obvious a fumble as the Xerox fumble, but mm -hmm. they, they fumbled it with very poor marketing. They had the world's fastest computer, DEC did, just before they crumbled. What was it called? Alpha. Yeah, the Alpha. And uh, they didn't know how to market it or promote it. Well, let's, let's get back to the question that I'm sure you've been asked too many times about, did Xerox fumble the future? Yeah, well, it, it's pretty clear. Most of the stuff that people use today when they use a computer, mm -hmm. Windows, bitmap display, Ethernet, electronic mail, servers of all kinds, print servers, file servers, name servers, distributed computing architecture, all that stuff was invented by the computer science lab at Park. Today, when you use a computer, you're using that technology. So, it's pretty clear that Xerox fumbled the future. Bob, one thing I brought, which you thought you'd get a kick out of, two things, Juliana Lavendel's book. <laughs> 
Juliana, so I saw an email message from that she sent. I forget who, who she sent it to. And she alluded to the fact that the uh, internet was invented by a guy in Washington, D.C. She was talking about Khan. Hmm. The internet was invented right under her nose, uh, on nose. the floor below where her office was. And she didn't even know it. A, a favor to ask of you, at the beginning I managed to bag a whole bunch of signatures about 10 years ago. And you were down at the Digibarn. And I plumb forgot to ask you to sign this thing. But there's some of the... Uh, the park alums there. Many of these people, with the exception of Peter Deutsch and Charles Simone, all of these people were third tier people, not principals. Mm -hmm. So I don't think I'll sign it. You won't sign it? I don't think so. Gosh darn it. <laughs> well, I have two more signatures here uh, that may have not have been third, third tier. Uh, Bob Sproul and oh. John Shaw. Oh, well, those are two first-class <laughs> All <right>. people. <laughs> I'll sign on that page. There you go. You don't want to be in that other company. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. All right. I have another document that uh, will interest you, which I don't know if I shared with you when you were down at the Digibarn. This is... The preliminary Macintosh business plan. <laughs> now the story behind this, now we'll take a look. Yeah. Do not Xerox, right? Yeah. But what this is, so Steve Jobs is taking over the Macintosh project at Apple from Jeff Raskin. Right. One of the first things he does is he says, we need a business plan uh -huh. for Apple for the 80s. Uh -huh. And I want the actual printed business plan to have pull down menus and look like the Alto that we saw at Park. So Johanna Hoffman, who's in charge of this project of creating a business plan, uh -huh. they tried to do it on an Apple III and they can't, right? Because right. there's a crappy printer and whatever. Right. And then she remembers, there is a place that I can make a business plan that has graphical elements and can be printed out. At Park. At Park. And right. I have a friend at Park with an office and what I'll was, get in touch was, with him. What was the friend's name? You know, I don't know. <laughs> He's fired. Well, <laughs> so what, but what she heard, her friend tells her, he, she says, look, if you come in after midnight, security's left the building, you can go into my office, pull a disc platter from the top shelf, right. put it in, and run Bravo and the paint programs, right. and do your thing. So what she did night after night is go in <laughs> and do this, and before employees or security came in in the morning, she would run them off copies on the Dover laser printer, and she would print them out in a stack on the Dover and go to Apple and hand them out at meetings with Steve Jobs. When Daniel Kotke and I discovered this thing in a box of crap in his house on Webster Street in Palo Alto, and he said, oh my God, this still exists. And I found Johanna, and I got the story from her. And I said, do you realize that this became public in the 80s when the lawsuit started to be filed about intellectual <laughs> property and all that stuff? This is such a compelling piece of industrial espionage, directly, yeah. uh, that this would have caused even courts that didn't understand software to injunct against Apple and mm -hmm. stop them and force them to acknowledge. So I thought you'd get a kick out of this thing. You know, I think I've heard fragments of this story before, that Apple created uh, Macintosh-related documentation by coming into Park. This was it. At night, yeah. This was the business plan. It's not only the business plan for Macintosh, but for Lisa and the whole of the Apple Corporation. So it was their plan for the 80s. And so I asked Johanna, I said to her, this has multiple meanings, this do not Xerox thing. It really means we're not copying Xerox or we're going to steal Xerox and eliminate them. And she right. said, yeah, when I was drawing this logo and putting it here, I sort of thought, what am I doing? I'm an Apple employee stealing from under the, <coughs> under the noses, of, and it turns out under your nose in 81. Uh, but it, it's, a, it's a very ironic document. And now that Steve has passed, we're publishing this whole thing online now. Because Steve never knew this was going on. He just got this nice looking business plan that looked like an Alto screen. Mm -hmm. And you, you don't know uh, for a fact whether she did this at uh, at SDD or at Park? It was at Park, not SDD. 
But one of the things she mentioned to me was she was very nervous that one of the nights she would come into this office and the platter, the three megabyte platter would be missing. And that somebody putting it in their alto and would discover this Apple confidential document, send it around the network, but it was never found out. Well, I doubt very much that she could have done this inside CSL because people in CSL despised Steve Jobs to a person. Mm -hmm. Steve Jobs was a college dropout who didn't know shit about computing. And the CSL people were PhDs in computer science who had done a lot of stuff with computing while they were in graduate school. Uh, So there was no respect for Steve Jobs. Mm. Were you there when he famously came? When what? When Jobs came and got the demo? No, I I was a park employee, but I was out of town. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they arranged Jobs' visit to coincide with the fact that I was out of town. Mm. Because they, I think it was widely known how CSL felt about Steve Jobs. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We, we laughed at his Apple II and was Apple, was the first one called Apple I? One, Apple know. One and Two, yeah. Two yeah. but the Two was the first one. Yeah. Really. Compared to an Alto, it was, it was laughable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, anyway. So, um, when I met you the first time, you said, Silicon Valley is the wrong name for Silicon Valley. Right. Give me that riff. <laughs> Give me the give me the argument. Silicon Valley has almost nothing to do with silicon. The principal activity in Silicon Valley is software, not silicon. Simple argument. Um, let me ask you this: Why do you think Silicon Valley works such a creator of wealth and innovation, or maybe it doesn't work right because you know it was the Mac at the Alto, for example. Well, that wasn't Silicon Valley's fault. That was, that was because Xerox refused to engineer a low-cost version of the Alto. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. John Ellenby, when I met him, he showed me this letter, said Alto 3 proposal, and told me about this one-board Alto that was yep. going to be able to be sourced out of Xerox like Ethernet was. Yep. And it would have revolutionized the world with the yep. built-in bit blit and yep. interrupts and stuff like that. And what was the story behind the Alto 3? Xerox wasn't interested. Xerox had created the system development division to do the STAR. Hmm. And the STAR was designed to be not just a computer, but a complete system. And it was very expensive because it had many components, printers, Ethernet. And uh, it sort of outdesigned itself in a mm-hmm. way it was uh, <laughs> it was uh, too slow mm-hmm. it, it's, it's, it's what, what should I say its ambitions were too great its design abilities could not live up to the ambitions so it, it fell short it was too slow it was too to cost too much uh, and so it wasn't a big success it did sell some but it wasn't a big success and so Xerox looked at that and said we're done mm. so we're not going to do any more of this but, but that's not surprising Xerox didn't know anything about the computer business. It's a copier company. Mm-hmm. I had a conversation with John Warnock about 15 years ago, and he told me this story, and you might know the story, but Peter McCulloch came to Park one sort of last time, because mm-hmm. I guess he'd created this architecture of information, vision, back no, in 69. His speech writer, his speech writer created that, and, okay. and neither the speech writer nor McCulloch knew what it meant. Right. So McCulloch still didn't know what any of this meant because John told me that he's sitting and doing a demo on the Alto of Interpress and how we could wrap documents and, you know, important stuff or a copy or whatever, printer company. And he sort of noticed McCulloch not really looking at the screen at all. And then he said, Peter, you've been here so many times and been shown this stuff. Well, what do you think? And Peter McCulloch said to John Warnock, it's just interesting to me to see so many men typing. Yeah. And then in one fell swoop, John realized he's not even been looking at the screen. He's been looking at the fact that there's men typing. He's a World War II kind of a guy and secretarial pools and all this. And then Peter turned to John Warnock and said, John, if you're so excited about all this stuff and dedicated, why don't you just leave Xerox and form your own company? And John Warnock was like, 
I just can't believe what I just heard. And uh, Peter left. John ran down the hall to Chuck Geschke's office and said, we're free, we can go. And that was the birth of Adobe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, about men can't, men won't type. In Boca Raton, there's, uh, you heard this Boca Raton story about how it is that men won't type? The future day thing? Right. After a show in the morning on stage, demonstrating all the applications for an alto, in the afternoon we set up a demo areas for the attendees, 250 top managers in Xerox and their wives mm -hmm. could come and go sit down at a alto and play with it. And the women all went down and sat at the altos and played with them and the men stood around the outside and watched. No men went and sat at an alto. Mm -hmm. And you realize then that, uh, or I did, that, well, uh, this is not going to be easy. Men don't type. Men don't type. My secretary types. Right. I got a, a good uh, anecdote both from Thacker and, and, and Lampson. And they said, uh, you know, after we built the Max, we finally started listening to Bob. <laughs> And he, he'd been telling us what to do for a long time, but we didn't understand it then. So what were, what were you telling them? Build a personal machine where the display is the design center. The design center of computers in those days was the arithmetic unit. Everything, all the design was focused on making that as efficient and as, as possible. So I said, look, uh, I told them, the eyeball is the connection between the brain and the computer. The computer, therefore, has to be centered on the display. And furthermore, it has to be personal. It had, we, we want one for every user. We don't want to have to share. As soon as you start sharing a computer, then they start running slower in the daytime. You understand that? Yeah. So uh, I kept telling them that, and they, they finally agreed. Now, I, I know you funded uh, Engelbart, and I also know you were at his kind of Futures Day, the, the, what we call him <laughs> the, the demo, the, the mother of all demos, I guess they call it now. Right. Do you have anything to say about that demo? That... Well, yeah, sure. I was there. There was about a thousand or more people in the audience, <clears throat> and they were blown away. Mm -hmm. He got a huge standing ovation after it was over. And the reason they were blown away is that nobody had ever seen anyone use a computer in that way. It was just remarkable. And how much of the Alto's kind of... Application. Application design, you know, it, it became a display-oriented computer with yeah, a mouse uh, yeah, and a full yeah. suite. Engel, how much Engel, of it really Engelbart's came from, work, you know, Engel, Engelbart's work influenced that a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, so, some of our people, Peter Deutsch, Jim Mitchell, spent summers on occasion working in Engelbart's group just as visitors. Mm -hmm. Some before there was a park. Park wasn't opened until 1970 and the, the demo to end all demos was in 68. So we had people in our group at park who knew a lot about NLS. That was the name of the Engelbart system. And uh, we saw that if we had a, a personal computer with a bitmap display, that we could then use the Alto for a lot of different things that people had not been using computers for, but that Engelbart had. And that's what we did. And how much of it was kind of also, should I say, inspired by this Dynabook idea that Alan Kay always had? Not at all. Not at all. What do you think of this Dynabook? I think it's the most famous computer that was never built. <laughs> Deservedly so? What? Deservedly so, or is it just Ooh. kind of vaporware? Yeah, it's vaporware, but it's very successful vaporware. <laughs> Hello, love. Hi. How Hello, are you doing? Man. How are you? <laughs> what you got? Hi. Saki. Yeah. <laughs> right. I hope you can now see and hear that when I say that Bob Taylor created the modern digital world, there is nobody else who could possibly fill those shoes including Steve Jobs.
Steve and everyone who came into the scene in the 70s and 80s were all riding on Bob's coattails and the innovations from teams he led and fed at his various labs. Bob will be greatly missed by me and all who knew him and attended his annual Tomato Fest parties at his home. Thank you, Bob, for all you did for the world, and wherever you are, may you found a new lab with an open network, creative first-level people, and no big organization or marketeers to interfere. Visit this episode, number 56, at www.levityzone.org to find many resources about Bob's life and times, including our extensive collections of artifacts from his labs at the DigiBarn Computer Museum. We will bring you more conversations with Bob in future podcasts, as there was so much more to say that day.